Programming Throwdown, episode 136, Metaverse with Daniel Liebeskind. Take it away, Patrick. Welcome everyone to another episode of Programming Throwdown. Hard to believe we're on 136. I think I say that every time now. It's the yeah, the time continues to fly. The direction of time is an arrow. Oh, no, no. Okay, sorry. We're not <laughs> time making... flies like a banana or something? Or is that fruit, fruit flies like a banana? That's okay. I... Oh, you're over my head now. <laughs> um, all right. Well, welcome. We're here on a what I think is going to be a really awesome episode. Talk about, I guess, you know, sometimes we, we see those list of buzzwords and a lot of times they just wash over us. You don't know uh, necessarily what they mean. But we have someone who has made it their current mission to tackle what is the metaverse and to build out a part of that and to just, you know, be immersed in it. So I think they're going to help us on our journey of going from metaverse as a as a buzzword and something that I think I've read in a couple science fiction books into, uh, you know, bringing it down to earth and what does it mean today? And what does it mean to be sort of like working in the metaverse and, and how are we, where are we at in that, that journey to uh, this, I, this cultural idea, I guess. Um, okay. That was a lot. That was a big setup. All right. I think I'm going to introduce the co-founder and CEO of Topia. Daniel, welcome to the show, Daniel. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm uh, pretty fired up to be here. All right. Well, I, I did have a pretty big setup, so we got a lot to cover. But before then, I, I mean, tradition is we, we kind of always start with people's, you know, kind of like story, their origin story, right? Every good superhero always has to not. Oh, wait. Uh, um, we are going <laughs> to sort of, you know, kind of how you got into tech. Like, where did being interested in this this crazy world of tech start for you? And it could be like, it, you know, first time you had a computer or learned programming or just like, what is a memory for you that you feel is like, ah, oh, yeah, that's when I kind of got bit by this bug. Yeah, I was, uh, I was a gamer as long as I can remember, you know, from, from as young as I can recall really doing anything. Uh, I had a computer, I was playing games. My parents encouraged me uh, when I was younger, when I was very young to play things like Math Blaster and, and oh, uh, games so like that, good. you know, to really date myself. Um, but, you know, I also started experimenting with uh, programming languages like QBasic um, really early on and actually trying to build my own video games. Um, even when I was like seven, eight years old, I, I think. Oh, wow. And, you know, I did that with a friend. And that was sort of the origin of my deep appreciation for computing and for the ability to be a sorcerer and actually conjure something from scratch if you have some technical capabilities. And then in high school, I took programming classes. I built some RPGs in Java. Uh, I was also building websites for uh, for myself and for others. Uh, and dabbling with entrepreneurship, I had a I had a, a slew of failed startups when I was when I was in my uh, you know in my youth uh, and you know kind of bringing those those two passions together I was also you know I played some sports and did outdoorsy things but you know my real passion was uh, was games and in particular I got pretty deep into MMOs uh, Star Wars okay. Galaxies EverQuest yeah. before that and those kinds of experiences, you know, you were kind of coming together real time with other people across the internet. And I did that with some of my friends from high school, Galaxies in particular, we played pretty religiously, but uh, also with strangers and forming clans, you know, clans was a big thing uh, in sort of the 90s and, and early 2000s when I was doing a lot of this. And the idea of building community online with other real humans and then interacting synchronously um, was just, you know, kind of mind blowing. So I know we're going to get into the metaverse, but that, that for me is actually the origin of my interest in this idea of the evolution of the internet into something that's more synchronous. Um, and I remember, you know, even when I was really young, telling my parents about the kinds of things I was doing online where I was building businesses in Star Wars Galaxies and I had a clan and a whole community and they were, they thought I was, you know, uh, either onto something and this is going to be an amazing outcome for my life or I was going down a spirally pit and they had no idea really what to do. I would say that's everybody's current conversation whenever someone brings up cryptocurrency. You either know something or you're crazy. Absolutely. Sorry. Absolutely. All right. Well, that was that was awesome. Wow. <laughs> so you you kind of did my job for me. You like really set that all up and and got it going. Uh, do you remember what your first computer was? Some people do and some people don't. Wow, that's a good question. I don't actually recall what it was. No. No, no, no. That's all right. 
Some people have this like really big attachment like to the specifics of, of their computer. I think that it also at some point kind of shifted into what do you call like a white box PC and in which it's like, I don't know, it's just like a PC. I don't know. Yeah, I'm a... definitely in that other camp. I still have my Commodore 64. It doesn't work, but I just can't throw it out. It's just, it's sitting in a closet and I just don't have the heart to put it to pasture. Oh, but yeah, I mean, the, the age you described, you know, when MMOs first started being a thing, not only could you play a game. You could play a game online. And not only was it like, oh, I'm just going to shoot my friends and this is hilarious because multiplayer uh, is in Quake is, is awesome. But, you know, actually like go on adventures together and story build together and, you know, just get immersed into this was a, a crazy time. Even, even today, I think I've never played EVE Online, but I'm like envious of the people that just have this like deep ingrained passion. I like read the after, after battle reports and I'm just like, this sounds so exciting. And I watch a YouTube video getting started. And I'm like, mm, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, it, that whole thing is, I could totally see what you're, what you're describing about how like formative that is and in getting involved and in going down, going down that path. So that's, that's really awesome. Yeah. I've tried to Eve. Uh, I tried to start Eve a couple times throughout my life. And uh, each time I just couldn't quite get over the, the learning curve of it. Uh, the same is true for me in Dwarf Fortress, but but that's another topic or another time. I had the same experience with Eve, but I did uh, sink a ton of time into Dwarf Fortress, probably an uh, embarrassing amount of time into Dwarf Fortress. Yeah, it's really hard now that they've decided to add hour counters to all of the gaming things and tell you how many hours you've played. I, I don't appreciate this. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right, cool. So... So yeah, so you started programming at a young age and you talked about, you know, kind of doing stuff in Cubase. I feel like that's a story uh, similar for me. I remember having a, a programming calculator in high school and like programming just dumb little games to, you know, occupy my time. But like you said, you, you, you kind of equated it to sorcery. I mean, I think it's, it's funny because people outside of uh, computers and programming view it that way. But I think even inside, you're right, like it still feels that way sometimes that like you can just program some simple rules or even just an algorithm you think is supposed to work. And you're like, wait, that didn't work or it didn't do what I was supposed to. Oh, it's smarter than me or it's not as smart. You know, it's just it's crazy sometimes how you think it takes on a life of its own. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's part of the motivation uh, as I got older. So I, I did a little bit of a detour. I went into finance. We can talk about that. Um, I was at Lehman Brothers. I did. I was uh, an investor in oh. VC. Um, and then I went back into programming. And the reason really is I missed being able to create things and conjure things. And, you know, really, when you're a programmer, when you're technical, you have your fate in your own hands. Anything you can imagine, for the most part, you know, depending on what you specialize in and, and what kind of programmer you want to be. But, um, you know, you, you have the ability, once you're technical, to actually just manifest whatever it is that you can imagine. And your imagination is really the only limiter. And to me, that is just an incredible thing that that's possible in, uh, in the world. That's actually a great point. So, so yeah, to, to dive in that one second. So you went into finance and obviously into VC, you're no longer there. Uh, I feel like those are, that's a world that I know a few people who have left finance and, and come to, you know, just the, the broader programming world. But I mean, do you have like any just kind of like words or wisdom or observations about the difference of sort of being a tech person or programming inside of finance versus out? Or is it, is it overdone? It's really just the same thing. Well, I, I actually was not a programmer inside of finance. I oh, okay. completely left programming, essentially. I mean, I was, I was still a wizard at, uh, you know, Excel macros and, and that sort of <laughs> stuff. But I was a traditional investment banker for Lehman and then, and then Barclays once Lehman went under. Uh, and then in my VC role, I was, you know, I was an investor. I was not uh, really doing programming. Um, again, you know, I was, I was doing a lot of little interesting hacks with Excel and um, you know, basically building applications uh, within my role, but that was not actually, you know, that wasn't actually what I was supposed to be doing. Um, and I, I really did that because I, I love creating things, but I want to understand how businesses work and how mm. accounting works and, you know, be a little bit more full stack. I, I actually look at my own life as a video game, right? Like an <laughs> RPG, right? And so uh, you have different skill trees and you can gain experience and level up these different skills and specialize in things. Um, and so, you know, I've kind of been on a quest, on many quests throughout my life to just gain as many uh, of these skills as possible so that I could be, um, you know, sort of like a multidisciplinary uh, entrepreneur and creator and sorcerer and, and whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it. 
Oh, interesting. So you were there though, right around the financial collapse then? I mean, do you have any horror stories about that? That is not, that's off topic, but. Yeah, I was, I was at Lehman uh, as it collapsed, essentially. I was actually an intern, um, to be fair. And they gave, you know, the writing was on the wall that summer. It was during the, you know, Bear Stearns went under um, and everybody was panicking. So normally they gave like 98% of interns full-time offers. In my year, um, they gave like 15%, something like that. Uh -huh. And I was fortunate enough to get a full-time offer. But then when I went back to school, Lehman collapsed. And I was like, all right, I'm going to move to China and become a Shaolin monk. That was actually my plan. And then uh, <laughs> uh, Barclays acquired some of the employees, including me. Um, and uh, so I, I went and did that there. And I was a healthcare. I started as a healthcare investment banker. When I went into VC, I was uh, focused on healthcare software as a service. Um, and then I left that in 2013 to just be like, all right, I'm just going to go back to pure full-time building. I went to a coding boot camp called Hack Reactor uh, and um, you know, learned a lot of the modern frameworks like JavaScript, Node, um, a lot of Java. It was very JavaScript-based uh, coding boot camp. And then from there, I just, you know, basically for the next decade, I just built things. Um, and I had a dev shop. I had my first, what, what is now referred to as the Metaverse platform in 2015. Uh, it was called Body, and it was a way for fitness instructors to teach live interactive classes, create their own branded fitness studios, build community around it, and then be able to see the participants and have participants see each other during classes. Um, and then from there, I built 20-ish different applications as part of my dev shop. Um, and so, and I traveled the world. I was a digital nomad. I lived in communities in Bali and Thailand, and um, I lived in San Francisco, New York, LA. And yeah, that's, that's kind of my history. Wow, that's that is quite an epic journey, I guess. So you really were serious about the uh, life as an RPG, I guess. Absolutely. All right, cool. So I, I mean, all right, I, I think we we have a feel for like, well, maybe not a feel, but we at least have, have had a glimpse of uh, getting there. So what led you to kind of you, you talk, started talking about building kind of like digital worlds about the metaverse and getting encounters with this? Uh, what was the genesis of of your current endeavor? So, you know, again, kind of like that RPG, I've been building towards this for um, for many, many years, including in 2015 with, with the startup that was using very similar technology. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's a combination of a few things, but it's this idea that the, uh, the internet is going to evolve from something that was asynchronous, like email, you know, you write something and then sometime later, somebody writes back, even like a Facebook wall is, is asynchronous. Um, and evolve more towards the kinds of experiences and community and connection that, that we have, uh, we've had with MMOs for decades now. Um, and I've had a lot of conviction around that. Um, and, you know, I've actually along the, in that journey have been told that that's not true by people that you would respect and, and be like, okay, that person actually really knows. Uh, it was a very unpopular opinion in 2015-ish uh, in timeframe where people thought that uh, the real leverage of the internet was going to be to become more asynchronous, right? And if you think about things like TikTok, for example, that that is true, right? There is a lot of leverage in uh, sort of async social platform like TikTok. But the reality is that uh, there's an opportunity for the internet to be something that is more connective, that, that more closely emulates how we connect in real life. Um, and so, you know, it just felt to me like, why do people not see that this is an inevitability? We already have it in MMOs. Clearly, this is going to be uh, something that's going to be used for productivity, for remote work, for remote, remote community and fun. And even non-gamers are going to be able to interact with each other in the way that, uh, that gamers do right now through multiplayer. Um, and so, you know, as part of that conviction, I also, you know, I have lived in, lived in many different communities. I've seen... Um, organizers of events and artists and creators, musicians, uh, yoga instructors really struggle to uh, build a global audience and build a global community and bring people together um, and do digital marketing and those sorts of things. So I was always very passionate about uh, trying to create a platform to help and empower uh, creators. And then, um, you know, I guess the, the sort of like last piece of it is, you know, the idea of creating something that where you can bring your community to a platform across the entire internet, right? And so when we talk about the metaverse, it's kind of the intersection of the real-time internet and Web three. Um, and I've, you know, I've been a uh, decentralized 
uh, back end or, or database person since 2012, I invested in Bitcoin. Um, you know, I was an Ethereum developer in 2017. So I've kind of dabbled in these technologies as well. And I, I essentially smashed all of my interests and passions together into one unified platform, which is Topia. And my plan originally was to build this over the 2020s um, and, and basically, you know, make it so that uh, the whole world could collaboratively create social experiences in virtual worlds. Um, and then bring community together. And uh, I was planning on doing it in the 2020s. I had a VR platform I was building for this. I had a Bitcoin Lightning game, browser-based game that I was building. And then the pandemic hit. And I realized I didn't have a decade to build this thing, that people mm. actually needed it right now. And things like Burning Man, which we uh, co-hosted in, in 2020, and then again in 2021, you know, they needed a way to do this online in a way that still felt like Burning Man. And so I basically threw out everything I was doing, started from scratch, um, and launched the, we had our first public event three weeks after the first line of code. Um, and you know, the rest, as they say, is history. Oh, wow. So metaverse, as I hear you describe it and telling this, you know, different than I think maybe I want to say everyone, but that's not true. Not everyone. But I remember when second life launched and everyone, went, oh, this is going to be the thing. This is the future. This is the, the thing. And one of the differences between how I view Second Life, well, okay, which for people who don't know, was like a 3D video game where you had an avatar and you could move around in a world that was not our world, but a different world. Um, but one of the things that is different from how here I hear you describing what you're saying now versus like what Second Life was is, it is even kind of in the name. Second Life is like an alternate life. You're living out some alternate, I'm going to say fantasy but not, you're not supposed to be who you are. You're supposed to be pretending to be someone else. And we talked about it, like a role-playing game, like a game, right? Even if there's no traditional kind of maybe game elements to it, it was still meant to be, you know, that kind of like not, not who you are. The way you're describing what you're saying, like a place to host, like something like Burning Man. Well, I, I guess there's maybe some caveats in there as well. But like, you know, it, it's more you to connect with like real life, but on the internet, right? Like something that you would do building a community. I hear you talk about it in terms that sound more like a replacement for something you would do in physical real person rather than, than a video game. Am I sort of hearing that like delineation correctly? Do you feel like there's a difference between those two? Yeah, I think you're hitting the nail on the head in many ways. And Second Life you know, I have a lot of respect for and the creator of Second Life, Philip Rosedale, is a friend of mine, John uh, Zanowski, who's the C who was the CFO for a period, is actually our CFO, and so we have oh, okay. <laughs> deep roots into uh, into what they created. And you know, it's it's kind of the the OG of this industry and of what we're doing in many ways. Um, you know, I think for us, it's less about focus on the avatar, as you said, right, um, and more on human connection. That's one of our principles when we think about building product, you know, for us, it's about human connection, accessibility, and creating safer spaces and, and consent uh, built into the product itself. And so, you know, for us, the idea of human, real human connection, you need to actually see other humans and be able to look them in the eyes, right? That's part of how we evolved to actually authentically connect with one another. And so for us, um, we actually kind of abstract away the avatar. There are these um, cute little, we call them topies, and they're androgynous. They're you know they're they're essentially genderless. They you know you can select a different color and and you just walk around the room the world. But they're basically an embodiment of yourself, right? But it's not the focal point. The focal point in Topia is the other actual humans. And the reason that we did that is again, you know, human connection is uh, not we don't think about avatar to avatar connection, um, but instead about the ability to actually use things like uh, WebRTC, which is web real-time communication, to connect with other humans and see them, um, you know, see them as though you would in real life. So, you know, that, that's something that's important for us. We also, you, you said we're trying to replace real life, and I know you didn't mean it uh, directly that way, but I just want to point out that our mission is not to replace real life. We co-hosted Virtual Burning Man, you know, for the last two years, but in-person Burning Man is something that I've gone to for the last. I guess, you know, until it was paused for, for pandemic, I went six years in a row, right? And I love in person, I love real life. Um, but Burning Man, as an example, 70,000 people a year can go. And it's very expensive. It's actually mostly San Francisco people or, you know, wealthy tech people that are able to access that community. 
And the idea of it should be accessible by millions of people all over the world, regardless of socioeconomic background. And so what we're trying to do is not replace real life, but instead enhance uh, access to these communities and create hybrid experiences and communities that can exist in person and online. And frankly, you know, can exist online within Topia, but also can uh, use other platforms using uh, shared backends like blockchains to you know, bring the community across every platform that exists and, uh, and truly have a really flexible and scalable uh, community ecosystem. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so, so fair call out on replacement. So I guess, yeah, this, this part about can replace versus does replace. So I feel that there's, like you mentioned, that oh, I'm going to do this and not need to meet in real life. Maybe, maybe for some people or maybe for some things that, that's true. But I feel like this, like you're kind of mentioning, is almost an augmentation of what you do. So this isn't a, a replacement for that stuff, but a way to, to kind of complement it. So like you mentioned, when, when cost or a pandemic or, or some barrier prevents you from being able to, to go somewhere, that doesn't mean you can't have the same or a similar depth of experience online. Is that a better uh, rephrasing of it, I guess? Yeah, I think that's fair. It's it's also not just a barrier, um, but it's you know if you have if you get together with your whole community once a quarter, it's very expensive. People have to fly in. With something like Topia, you can do that quarterly get together in person, but you can also get together every week or every day, right? Or have a persistent open community space that's kind of like the town hall where people can just come whenever they want. All right. So I think I'm getting a picture, but what we've talked about so far in in your vision of of sort of of the metaverse as you're building it out is people are meeting, I want to say like for a cause or for a reason, like it sounds like targeted, right? Like I go here for like this community or this thing, but when I hear it described in the broader broader description, or we think of like, we mentioned sci-fi. So uh, I guess there was a movie as well, but the book Ready Player One or we can go even further back to like Snow Crash and okay, we're, anyway, we're going to get off on a sci-fi tangent. But like, if you go back, people wanted and went to kind of like the metaverse, the persistent online thing for no, no reason in particular, but maybe for entertainment or just to, as part of an everyday thing. And so do you feel like there's a difference between metaverse as a like, uh, I'm going for a reason, a, a, a need driven, need is too strong a desire to do a specific thing versus just like a, a place to just go. Do you feel like there's a difference there? Is like a transition? Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, you know, it's interesting when we, you bring up Ready Player One. I actually look at Ready Player One as a very dystopian outcome where uh, people <laughs> no longer get together in person. Everything is conducted online. I don't think that's what we should be shooting for here. I think that would be a, mis, a misfire in some ways. Um, and so, you know, I... I I don't know the answer to whether it's going to be purpose-driven usage or whether it's just going to be a place that you go all the time. I think it's probably a hybrid of of both, right? Where there are going to be specific purposes, kind of like how we do Zoom meetings right now. Those are all very specific, right? You don't like casually go into a Zoom hangout and just uh, mess around in there, right? They're they're meetings. They're very intentional. Um, So there are definitely cases like that. And you know, in things like Topia, there are um, there are conferences, there are events. Um, there is, you know, if somebody brings a thousand people in to celebrate their IPO together. Um, those are all very event driven, and uh, so you, you definitely have that now, and you will for sure have that in the future. We also are seeing a lot of persistent spaces that are just kind of community hangouts, and you know, you get off work, you go in and see who else is there. Um, you're hanging out and and kind of relaxing, kind of like when you're. Uh, you know, in university and you go down to the common area and just see who else is there. Um, so you kind of see that more casual, persistent hangout as well. Um, and, you know, I think both of those will definitely exist and it'll depend on the person. It'll depend on where you're using it for. Um, you know, one of the interesting things is that we see a lot of, especially during the pandemic, we saw a lot of remote work, um, but not as much remote play, right? And that's where um, things start getting kind of interesting. Remote work, everybody knows, obviously, that's going to be a thing. It already is. And we have a lot of productivity tools like Slack and Asana and, and uh, whatnot that really enhance our ability to work remotely. But what we've really missed from that is if you're going to be remote and work remotely, you kind of need to be able to have remote community and remote play and remote hangout, um, like go to the bar, right? Uh, when you're done with work for happy hour, 
that is uh, an experience that has been really challenging online historically. And that, those are the kinds of things that we're trying to uh, make accessible. Interesting. So again, okay, a, a lot, a lot there to unpack, I guess. But I mean, one of the things that I hear is the different communities and different kinds of things are happening in your mind. How does that work from like, a, is this one giant uh, instance? I get, oh, we talked about, you know, kind of like in the past gaming, right? There's, you know, might have a server for, you know, server A and server B and server C. And, and you can be on one server and everything's persistent and consistent in that server, but completely disconnected from the, the next server, which is in contrast, like we talked about EVE Online, where everything happens on roughly like uh, one homogenous set of servers and everyone's in the same world. For, for where you're at or where you think you're going, do you think this is something where people go to a partition and things and, and sets of rules and societal norms exist in like one partition different from a different partition? Or is this something that like, no, actually like it's all open and like it, it's smooth transition between them? I think that uh, this is a phenomenal question. And this is one of the big questions in the industry right now, right? You have uh, platforms like Facebook that just changed their name to Meta. They're trying to be the one metaverse to rule them all, right? And everything would take place in in the one uh, instance of the metaverse, kind of, and that's kind of the vision of Ready Player One, right? There's the Oasis. Yep. Everything happens in the Oasis. There's one platform that is the entire metaverse. I think the reality of what is going to happen here is going to be uh, more like the vision of Web3, which is uh, a decentralized metaverse where there are many different instances. This would be the best outcome for people, for humanity, is uh, to actually have many different options and to have them all interface with each other. Right, to create standards where you can bring a community from platform to platform, and maybe each platform offers you different things. It's a little bit like asking, in my mind, is there going to be one video game that everybody's going to play? Right? Is there going to be one MMO that every has every single player in it? Right? Or is there going to be one social platform that everybody uses and no other ones? And we haven't actually seen that happen with really anything in tech, so it would be shocking to me if that's what happens with the metaverse. As, as it's being envisioned. And, you know, and frankly, all the focus on, on Web3, and a, a, again, th that being like shared backends, uh, decentralized databases, being able to bring your community, your assets, um, your experiences that you're creating from platform to platform. I don't see how one platform or one company could just dominate an ecosystem like that. Okay, all right. I was actually going to ask, but I was missing the connection to sort of Web3, which... I guess we should do a definition for it as well, but we could do that maybe in a second. Um, but the sort of connection into Web3, but now I hear what you're saying. So if, if the world became one video game, then traditionally the architecture would end up being that some company or whatever, uh, some entity would control all of the assets, the back end, whatever, and the client. And so I guess like in what you're saying to, this is not exactly what you said, but in my head, it's sort of coming that maybe what ends up happening is if you want to have this persistent world where people are moving through, there may be many ways of interfacing with it. Maybe a VR way, maybe a 2D web browser way, maybe a variety of ways, but they share some sort of persistence in the back end. And maybe there's some specifics to the way you're accessing it in the client, but maybe there's a lot of jointly owned things behind the scenes. Am I sort of getting why the tie-in to decentralized is something you've repeated? Yes, that's exactly right. It's it's the idea of interoperability between different front ends, different clients, different applications, but having one unified back end. Um, and you know what what's interesting is, so I think there's a much higher likelihood that we have one unified back end than one unified front end, right? Or one option for the front end. Um, and even on the back end, though, you know we see a lot of different options. Ethereum is not the only game in town. Um, and, you know, it has the largest community, it has, um, you know, some legs uh, under it, uh, and, and a lot of development, but it has a lot of issues as well. And what I think is going to happen is that there's going to be a few different options for back end architecture. Each of these is a standard that allows us to on the front end, build integrations, you know, into these different back ends. And then you can bring this back end information between clients. And it actually means that anybody can spin up their own client. And so I think that what's more likely than one client dominating the entire thing is actually a uh, client engine, right? Think of like what Unity is for game development. Um, we're likely going to see metaverse ecosystem engines that allow you to just spin up your own front end and tie into this backend standard and customize it to be whatever you want. So then 
people can choose whether they want to bring their community that lives in this back in this shared public back end to your front end application based on whatever your specifications and and specialization is. I was going to ask you to help us define Web3, but actually, I think I think you might have just done it in sort of a way is like this as a broader vision. I mean, you kind of described it for a specific purpose, but I mean, is there anything else like, I mean, I guess you said you'd been in this space or whatever that you would tack on that it kind of goes towards the vision of, of like why people use it as a term distinct from, I guess, Web2, like the current web we largely know today? Uh, honestly, I think the, the difference between Web2 and Web3 is Web2 was all centralized. Every company, every application that you go to has a centralized database, a centralized backend. Um, so you go to Facebook or something, and they have a walled garden. They they own all of the information. And if you're if you're a creator and you're using any of these platforms, you need to go create within each platform very separately, right? They don't have a unified standard, and so as a creator, it's actually very challenging. And that's why you don't see that many people that that have a huge presence across many different platforms. So the idea of Web3, and this is maybe getting too into the, into the weeds on it, but um, the idea of Web3 is actually very creator-oriented. It's very community-oriented. It means that you can create once in a public database that is not controlled by any one company. And blockchain, really, all it is is a way for the world to collaboratively have truthiness of that public database, right? Because no one entity controls it. There needs to be a consensus mechanism uh, for everybody to arrive at the same conclusion about what's true, what what transactions actually occurred in this public database, um, and that that the the Web three evolution is really just the shift from everything being centralized within walled gardens for each application towards something that is a shared database called you know using blockchain consensus methodology. Then there to be infinite number of front ends that can all share the same backend information, and as a creator, that means you can go to this backend. And you can create once, and then it's up to the applications to figure out how to make your creations or your communities useful within their context, within their uh, you know ecosystems. And you have a lot of choice as a creator. So in the long term, it's very likely that these are going to succeed because all the creators, if there's enough application, enough utility, and enough value uh, being generated, then all the creators are going to choose that if they can, uh, because you know there's there's way more leverage. And so even Topia, you know, we consider ourselves Web3, uh, Web3 utility. We didn't tokenize our real estate. We're not selling uh, NFTs or anything like that. But if you, have, if you have a community in a public database, if you have an NFT collection, for example, you can actually use Topia to provide superpowers to your community. You can gate access to worlds. You can enable collaborative gallery creation. And, uh, and so, you know, we think of ourselves as a utility layer rather than an, as an origination layer. And there's going to be a lot of utility layers. That, that's kind of the point. So when you were talking about that, I guess, in, in the power of the community, and, you know, I, was, I, I always have this assumption that powerful tools need to be complicated. Like, I, I don't know, it's not correct. Like, I know it's not correct, but it's like this bias, maybe as a software engineer, right? If there's a hard problem, I need to build a good tool, a good algorithm. I need to read some papers, like whatever it is, right, to get my brain going. And solve a problem. Okay, this is probably a blind side. Anyways, but then, you know, I, I was playing yesterday with my kids Minecraft, which we were talking about something. They were explaining to me how Minecraft works, right? And I, I mentioned to them, I've been playing Minecraft since before you were born. Like, I, I, I understand what Minecraft, Jason and I have been playing, played Minecraft together probably, I don't know, more than a decade ago. And like when it was really early and... To be fair, our kids are way better than we are at it, so... Oh yeah, shut up. Uh, <laughs> don't talk about that. Uh, <laughs> They have much more time. But what, what I realized, I mean, it's much more complicated today than back then. But even this simple tool, like just a world of voxels and of a couple different types and taking some down and building some up, people build like insane things from relatively basic one. And then I was also, you were, you were talking and it's not exactly Web3, obviously, but I, if you haven't seen it, but probably most people have seen it, but if you hadn't seen it for April Fool's, I guess. Reddit did like R the place. I don't know if you guys saw this, but basically this giant canvas of blocks. You could place a rate limited, like one block on this giant shared canvas of some color. And yet, if you watch the time lapse of various communities, like going in and making their users go in and click one block to one color at their, you know, threshold of their, you know, changes per second. Uh, and then 
they're too small. So they band with another community and they go in there and other people can overwrite their colors. Anyways, if you've not seen it, go check out the like recap videos. But one of these things that you're highlighting reminds me like this is a relatively simple thing, right? Like you go in and you can make a color, but the, con the shared context that got built around it, not only in like looking at the images at any, you know, time slice and saying, I recognize what this is and what that is, but not what this other thing is. Or just like how the community is banding together and saying, this is good and that is bad. And reaching a, there's no consensus, but like the consensus of the canvas itself, right? Like there's this representation. Obviously it's Reddit. So Reddit owned all of that and like made their own choices and whatever. But what they allowed people to do in the communities within Reddit to express themselves in the way that they thought was best, whether it was text or an image or a pattern or a, you know, where, where on the canvas they wanted to be, where they thought they could be. It's just like fascinating, like experiment, relatively short lived. Uh, it's Reddit. So big asterisk, if you're sensitive, you, you know, going and reading what will happen there, but like, whatever. Um, I realize like what you're saying, maybe it isn't that people need, you know, some big, when we talk about those MMOs, right? It's like very expensive to build the video game engine in the world. And the creator has to be the company as well as the engine as well as like, it's all monolithic, right? And then you can go experience this world and do freedom things in it, but like ultimately it's very controlled. And what you're describing is not only the decentralization of the backend itself, like, you know, everybody can kind of do their own thing and it's consensus own, but as well as utilities and pieces of the pipe and pieces of the puzzle, getting conglomerated together in different ways and really distributing, not the, it's not a game, but distributing the use of it as well. Like everybody participates in this creation and derives their own economics from it. That, yeah, that's, that's very fascinating. I, I love that you just said the phrase shared context. Um, that's one of the things that just jumped out at me because uh, that is so important to the online experience uh, or really to uh, any community experience, right? Uh, a community really is a group of people that have uh, a common interest. And when you come together in a, for a community event, you have a shared context, right? You have a space that you're coming together in and you have a, a, a purpose, right? And so that actually is one of the uh, the missions of something like Topia is to make it really, really easy. Like you were just, you also were talking about, um, you know, having it be simple and not overly complicated. You know, our mission has been to make it incredibly easy to create a space, to create a shared context and then bring a community together in, uh, in that space. And when you think about it from a Web3 standpoint, you may have this community that exists, you know, everybody that owns a particular NFT, which is basically just an entry in a database or, or a ticket. You can think of it like a ticket, right? And, and, and everybody that's part of that community then wants to be able to come together within a shared context, within a shared experience. And experiences are really important, uh, shared experiences, because they're the foundation of memories, right? When, when you have a memory with somebody and, and to strengthen the bonds between individuals, um, you know, you really need to actually form memories with other people, which then you can reflect back on, but they, they serve as the foundation. And within a community, you know, your community is really only as strong as the bonds between individuals, which is based on shared memories, which are created from shared context and actually coming together. And so that that is the foundation of the belief that led to a platform like Topia. Um, and, you know, it's frankly where I think a lot of this... Um, online metaverse is going, is creating these shared contexts, making it really easy for people to change the context, right? It's, in Toby, you can very easily flip the scene. Uh, we call them scenes, but basically the entire world, you might be at Burning Man and then boom, now you're at like a happy hour or now you're at a music festival. You can go through a journey with your community and change context. And and that's kind of a, a, a superpower. You know, we, we talked earlier about replacing the real world. It's not about that. It's about doing things that are not even possible in real life, right? Being able to switch the entire shared context at, you know, with a, you know, a, a snap of the finger is not something you can do in real life. And in fact, if you're with a, a community in real life and you're at an event and you're like, let's all go to the after hours bar, you lose like 50% of people in that transition online. You don't have to lose anybody. Oh, that's yeah. That's interesting. You talked about, about music, and I'll bring in something we haven't talked about yet, but that gets brought in this conversation too. But I, I'm not a big, like, I, I don't enjoy music at the way some people do, but 
I have been to a few concerts and they're very noisy and messy, but, but you are right. The, like the shared context of being in like a place with X thousand, I don't know, hundreds, whatever, whatever the venue might be, but sharing that we're in the same place and in the same time and in the same smells and sights and this particular instance of the singer performing, who hopefully is not like lip syncing, but like actually performing, you know, is unique in some subtle ways. Right. And that experience is very different than sitting at my computer and turning on, you know, whatever it is, Spotify, Google, me, whatever. Anyway, there are many ways now, like, and listening to an album, right? The two are, I guess, like at some description and text the same, like you listen to this song by this performer, but like in practice as a human, they're actually incredibly different experiences. And the, it jogged my memory of the other, like, obviously big player in, in quote unquote metaverse that we hear we've not talked about, but has been trying to experiment with the shared context of many things. But, uh, you know, I guess concerts is the one that I think is most interesting because it's disconnected from the rest is Fortnite, right? And so Fortnite has been putting on concerts and having people go and, you know, partake in the concert in a video game. That's ostensibly about killing all the people around you. And yet they're doing this thing that's like completely not related to that yet somehow works. I'm not, gone to one myself but again reading them watching the videos afterwards it's it's it's, it's fascinating absolutely and we've actually had many con concerts in topia as well one of the really interesting things is that in the metaverse from what i've seen it's not the 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 mind-blowing part of it is not actually being in front of the stage like hearing the music that's better in person frankly you know feeling the bass flowing through you and you know the you technology in person system. yeah but but what's what's crazy is it's the in between. It's walking from stage to stage, which again in real life you can do. Um, but that's where a lot of the social interaction happens. It's away from the stage. It's in the paths between stages or on the outskirts where people are messing around and having serendipity and running into each other. Um, and you know one of the challenges of Fortnite is again it's avatars, right? So serendipity is challenging because you see an avatar, it's nameless, it's faceless. People can troll you still because you're hiding behind, you know, a, a cartoon and a username. Whereas in something like Topia, which, you know, you're seeing other humans, um, you have crazy serendipity moments where you, in the in-between between stages, you see somebody that you know. And you know that you know them because you can see them. Um, and, you know, that kind of experience, that's what happened at Burning Man. Um, that's what happens at music festivals um, in, in platforms like Topia. And uh, it's it's pretty wild. And again, you can do that in person, but you can't do it every week. I mean, some people go to you know concerts every week, uh, but you know it's very easy to just jump in for ten minutes to a to a music uh, experience and just try it out and and go mess around and have a social experience and then leave. Right? Um, it doesn't really cost you much um, in terms of time or energy um, or ticket cost. And, uh, and so those kinds of things in the metaverse are going to be really interesting. But, you know, it's, it's also just very much the beginning, right? So I actually think when we, when we think about the, I think you asked before, you know, what is the future of the metaverse? The reality is, you know, we're in very early innings of this thing. It's like the early 90s of the, uh, the old internet. And we don't really know exactly where this is going. But the idea of the synchronous internet, this evolution Really, the metaverse, when people talk about the metaverse, my definition is that it's two different things. Both are an evolution of the internet. One is towards shared backends, like we were talking about. The other is towards uh, real-time interaction and experiences like MMOs, right? Um, and the two together are the metaverse. And in the long term, they become a unified uh, energy, right? A unified evolution. And this is going to play out over 15, 20 years before we get the kind of impact that the current internet with cloud computing, you know, as an example, um, has, you know, fr from, from the first internet. Um, you know, I guess the last thing I would even just say on this is there's a lot of hype and speculation around the metaverse and Web3 and crypto. And, um, you know, it's again, it's a little bit like the early 90s. When we had the dot com boom. Right. And then a massive implosion. But those kinds of boom cycles and bubbles and then implosions are actually really important for technology because during the dot-com bubble, we actually had a huge amount of infrastructure get created. Fiber optic cable get, got laid everywhere, right? And then you wound up after the, the bust with a massive oversupply of, uh, of capacity, right? Which led to the cloud computing revolution where you had 
all of this supply and some brilliant person was like, why don't we make, why don't we decentralize access to, uh, to our excess supply and charge people just based on usage and stream it over the internet and the cloud computing revolution begins. And so we'll have probably similar kinds of boom busts, infrastructure builds, and then oversupply and, you know, some revolution that happens in 10 years based on this. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think like having a bust or a burst of a bubble doesn't mean things have failed quite yet. And actually, not just like that infrastructure build, but also the hard times really winnowing down to like the people who kind of have the right formula. Like you need the explosion of diversity in order to get those crazy ideas. And then when you get this like downward force selection pressure, like the good ones will survive in the back. Okay, anyways, that, that's a great observation. <laughs> but we're, we, okay, so we're getting through most of this. What I want to do though, is like, we've talked a lot about con concepts and even, you know, sort of Topia as a concept. Like what today you mentioned a few things like going between concert stages or even having like a, you know, access on to things that exist outside of Topia itself, like NFTs as a gallery or whatever. Like what today is Topia as a, if I go to it, like what, what is it like? What is, what is it based on? How are you guys accomplishing that? And then, you know, we'll sort of transition a little, a little that way. Yeah. So Topia, you know, really it's about um, making it really simple to create these shared contexts for your community. So all you, all you have to do is upload PNGs. We, first of all, we have a whole marketplace. We have a lot of templates. Um, there's a ton of free content. So you can create an entire world, you know, very easily and then customize it. And it's basically endlessly, very, very deeply customizable. There's no one style uh, of Topia. It's not like Minecraft where everything looks like the voxel-based blocks. Um, it can look like anything you want. And so we have a lot of different examples of uh, worlds that look like you're inside of a jungle or look like, um, you know, a 2D pencil sketch office or, uh, you know, really there's anything in between, right? It's, 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 it's just uploading PNGs. And then you can embed all sorts of content inside of each asset, make them interactable. Um, you can embed YouTube, Twitch Live, I guess, live, live streaming with Twitch or YouTube. Um, you can actually embed entire websites, uh, tools, games, multiplayer games. Um, and so, and, and, and people use that to, to do things like scavenger hunts. Um, you can do all, all sorts of sort of interactive, almost borderline MMO kind of endeavors and, and uh, interactions that uh, lead to shared memories and, and you know, experiences between people. Um, so, you know, those are the kinds of tools that we're building. And uh, we have a huge range of use cases within Topia. So, you know, as I mentioned, we kind of launch with Burning Man um, in many ways, but uh, people have had weddings, they have birthday parties. We had um, Asana when they IPO, they brought a thousand people together uh, inside of Utopia world. And, you know, the, the CEO is doing an all hands, like speaking out and broadcasting to the entire world. Uh, but in Topia, it's, it's, you can have a thousand people in a world and you click and move around. Um, it's, it's browser-based. It's very simple to move. Um, again, we tried to make it really accessible so my 95-year-old grandfather could have his birthday party in Topia. Uh, but you, know, you click and you move around and you're connecting with WebRTC over audio and video to the people that are closest to you. So people call this proximity chat or spatial chat. Um, we, you know, it's basically these customizable game worlds that are browser-based and then spatial chat where you click and move around and connect with people that are close to you. You can also broadcast to the entire world. So you can put a podium where whoever steps up to it is broadcasting. There's a lot of different features uh, and functionality, but you know, people have used it for, for bringing people, you know, the thousand people together to celebrate. We've had a lot of conferences. We have panels where a comic book launched on Topia and somebody made an, a completely immersive comic book walkthrough. So you know, you can basically embed products, content, books, comics, um, really anything you want. And, and think about it almost like, um, like a website, right? So every company, every project has its own website. But when you go to a website, you're by yourself. And it's often a directory of content. And you're kind of consuming this uh, by yourself in directory form, not really spatial, not really that immersive. You can think about Topia Worlds as basically an enhancement, you know, instead of just that website, you can have a spatial world that's immersive where you move around, go on a journey through the content and you do it with other people and it's persistent. So you don't have to like have a scheduled 
uh, Zoom meeting for people to be able to connect and, and come experience something, it can just be there. It can be the community space. It can You can co-create it with your community and then it can exist after whatever the event even was is over and people can use it as that town square. Um, and you know that that's what we've been doing for the last two years. We've also built everything. Um, so one of the big differences between Topia and really any other metaverse platform right now is that all of our technology is, or the foundation of it is peer to peer uh, WebRTC. So when you're in a Topia world, I, I guess for, for most metaverse platforms, um, I'm not sure about Zencaster, but I'm assuming it's the same concept. Anytime we're talking, our audio and video is actually going through a server, right? So there's a server, either an SFU um, or MCU units or, or what they're called. And the server is getting the stream. It's doing a bunch of processing. It's, uh, it's taking the streams. It's putting them into one unified stream and then, and then sending it back to you. With Topia, we are creating tunnels between two, anybody that you're connecting to between your, your devices. And so all the audio and video is uh, not going through a server. That means that uh, we can't transcribe. We can't record and transcribe everything that's being said, whereas every other platform pretty much can. Um, it also means for us that we have unlimited scalability, essentially unlimited scalability for very cheap. So it's very privacy-oriented. It's very scalable, but it's very hard to do. And so we've spent the last two years uh, doing that. And, you know, I've, I've been working on those technologies for the last seven years. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's something that's very exciting for us. Um, to be fair, we actually have a hybrid system. So you can do peer-to-peer -peer or SFU. Um, and you can switch between the two. And our broadcast, for example, is using SFU. Um, our peer-to-peer -peer is, um, you know, how most people are interacting throughout the world. Um, and, you know, very privacy-oriented. Um, we also, you know, have realized we've we've been building since the beginning. The origin of Topia, um, in many ways, was to allow any organization, company, brand to create their entire own metaverse ecosystem. Um, and so we've recently started making that available as well. Is uh, Topia as uh, basically a backend architecture and engine where you can spin up your own metaverse ecosystem. Um, and so for anybody that's interested in that, you can uh, you can contact us as well. Awesome. I think that a lot of this stuff you said makes sense. And it's very refreshing to hear someone like be upfront about the trade-offs of, yeah, you know, there's a lot of great things there, but you know, there's advantages and disadvantages. And so, I, I mean, it sounds, it sounds really interesting. People, okay, maybe we'll, we'll transition here at the end into talking about Topia as a company. I mean, tell us about like, I mean, obviously we, we kind of got a, a glimpse of what you're building or taste. I mean, people should go check it out. There's only so much you can do in a podcast. I mean, I've, been, I've, I've watched the videos. So when, when you're talking, I mean, I'm, I'm envisioning what you talked about in the videos, but definitely go check out the videos, try it out. But like, tell us about Topia as a company. Are you guys hiring? What's it like to work there? Do you guys do fully remote? Are you all in one place? Like, how does that work? We, uh, yeah, we're remote. Um, we do have some concentration in LA, which is where I am. You know, our culture is... You know, we're, we're a company that's making it so that you can basically uh, have community and remote play. We're very uh, oriented around that, right? And our, our values are around accessibility, human connection, uh, safety and consent. A lot of us, probably half the team has been to Burning Man many times. Um, and so, you know, we, um, you know, I would say that's, that's kind of the, the vibe of it. We think of ourselves as kind of like a um, everybody at Topia is really good at what they do, right? We're almost like special forces team that way um, and also very cross-disciplinary, um, but we don't hire anybody that is not really fired up about what we do. Um, and we use a term called Ikigai, which is a Japanese concept. Um, it's really, it's the intersection in our context, it's the intersection of uh, things that give you a lot of energy and that you are technically really good at and that drive impact. And we try for anybody that we're bringing on to figure out what is their Ikigai and is Topia and is the role that they would be having within Topia, you know, is that within their Ikigai? Um, and Ikigai is an amazing concept for individuals within a company. It's actually an amazing concept for the company within the world. Um, and so, you know, it's, uh, it's one of the ways that we think about things. Uh, but, you know, we, we use Topia uh, as a remote team to have happy hours. We do stand-ups in there um, a couple times a week. We do all hands. Uh, we have lots of different events and, and a lot of fun uh, together through that. We also, you know, as a remote team, we get together once a quarter in person. 
We just did that for the first time in Denver and went to Meow Wolf, which is like an in-person experiential uh, installation. If, if you guys haven't experienced it, it's, it's pretty oh, wait, cool. Wait, I think I read about this recently. Yeah, it's great. Okay. All right. I'm going to check this out. Is this the same one they built in Las Vegas with like the grocery store that all has like crazy food in it? Exactly. And that, okay, that's right, in yes. that's in Area 15 in, in Las Vegas. Um, and uh, Area 15 is basically like a shopping mall where every vendor is an experience provider. Um, and so one of those experiences in Vegas is Meow Wolf. In Denver, it's a standalone installation. There's also one in Santa Fe. Um, I think those are all the Meow Wolves, but they're, you know, it's kind of like a video game in real life is, uh, is, yeah. is what it's. Yeah, yeah. I saw some video very briefly from, I think like Omega Mart or something. I, I, I my, I, it's crazy. I'm like, it's on my list. I got to go check this out. Definitely. Yeah. It's got some like Fallout vibes if you played Fallout. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll get off topic. Get off topic. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but okay. So, so I mean, Topia, are you guys, so you mentioned hiring people who, who are super passionate and know what they're doing. I mean, are you guys looking to hire? Do you guys do internships? How does that, how does that work? Yeah, we would love, uh, we would love some college interns. Um, that's, uh, that's one of our initiatives right now. We are hiring across the company as well. We're likely doing uh, fundraising towards the end of the summer. Um, we have a lot of traction right now with our engine, as we're calling it, um, you know, our sort of like metaverse engine. And uh, that's been really, really exciting for us because we're seeing companies now being able to create their own metaverse ecosystems um, and be able to configure them. So one of the things for, for me has been um, creator empowerment, but also just deep customization of the experience. I, I, I want the internet of the real-time internet to have lots and lots of different experiences. And that means not just worlds that look differently, but actually different interfaces, different user experiences, different experience types. Um, and so, you know, that's since the beginning been part of our mission. It's now starting to connect, um, which is really exciting. And it means that we're going to be, you know, we are hiring right now, but we're going to be hiring a lot, uh, a lot of additional people towards the end of the year. Um, and so, you know, even if something's not listed on our career site, uh, if people are really, anybody that's really passionate about this space should reach out to us because it's more important to me. I'd rather hire somebody that's really passionate about what we're doing that has a little bit less experience um, or maybe where their experience is a little bit more nebulous, right? But it's relevant to what we're doing and where we're going. Um, so, you know, we've, we've hired, actually most of the people we've hired so far have been referrals or people reaching out to us. We have done less of the us reaching out or doing general solicitations or even posting on our career site. And, you know, one of the reasons is that we find that people that are referred by people already at Topia or people we trust and our allies uh, or people that are aggressively pursuing us are more likely to get what we're doing, be really passionate about what we're doing and be joining Topia because they, they believe in our, our mission and our vision and our values. Awesome. And then for the rest of the listeners, like if they go to the website today, um, I mean, is there something for them to check out? Like, what would you recommend as like dipping your toes in the water? Yeah, you can go to topia.io and you can create a world for free. You can use it for free forever. You can bring up to 25 people at a time for free and you can customize the world. You can put all sorts of YouTube embeds, Twitch embeds. Uh, you can embed your website. You can also, uh, you know, for those that are interested, you can actually embed Topia within your platform as well. And we have a lot of folks doing that. Uh, within your website, within your platform, you do have to contact us and, and ask us for permission to do that. We have to whitelist you. But you know, there's a lot of ways to uh, to try this out, to embed it within your own workflow, within your own community, um, and to do that right now. This has been really great. I feel like it's been an awesome exploration. I think we've touched on a whole bunch, a little like maybe a little shallow, but like we covered a lot of ground and that's been really awesome. And I think this, as you said, is a, a space that's maturing and growing. And I feel like it's very early, so it's a bit hard sometimes to picture the trajectory, but I feel like you, you're kind of saying, I, I, you never know, but it feels like there's a lot of potential here. It feels like something that's been missing, something that, that would be awesome to have. We don't exactly know the right form yet. I mean, I'm, I'm glad to hear that there are people out there really tackling to make that you know, more concrete. And so I, I, you know, I'm, I'm really excited. I think this has been a great discussion. Yeah, me too. And you know, I, I think what I would encourage people to, uh, to think about is just like the social, you know, social platforms and becoming an influencer, um, you know, those that 
figured that out early, had a huge advantage. And I think with the metaverse, it's a similar kind of thing. You know, just dipping your toes in, starting to become familiar. Then as this whole thing evolves, you have some context. You have some some base understanding of what's going on. You've tried a few of the different platforms. And so, uh, you know, you don't have to wait five years to try out the metaverse. It's here right now. And it's it's going to be beneficial to you, your company, your career to uh, start messing around with these technologies. Yeah, I feel today those like influencers get like a bad rap, but I I kind of in line a bit with what you're saying. I don't think so. I think it's just early adopters or people who figured it out and are helping others figure it out, right? Either for their own personal gain or for helping companies connect to people or be it what you may. I mean, maybe some are more uh, more ill-intended than others, but I mean, for the most part, I just view this as like you're saying, these are people who got on tried to understand and if you ever listen to a youtube youtuber i guess that or like someone talk about the craft itself the inside baseball it's so much experimentation and trying stuff and frustration it's not that they just like go up there and, and do i mean there's a lot of work behind it and so i think you're right i feel it, you know if the the metaverse really becomes this like platform as a whole in various forms uh, the people who are early adopters are going to have a huge leg up in the understanding what's been tried and what works and what doesn't work and not repeating those mistakes or repeating them before everyone's watching, I guess. Absolutely. And, you know, there is some overlap with, uh, with influencers. We actually, within Topia, we call them confluencers. Um, so within Topia, the, the influencer is a confluencer. And in nature, a confluence is where multiple rivers come together and become one. In a social context, a digital context, a confluencer is an entity that brings people together to become a community. And so empowering organizers, like everybody has those friends that are really good at just bringing people together. They're kind of like the unsung heroes of every community, of every group of friends. And, uh, you know, what we sought to do is to empower those kinds of people to create this space, bring people together and earn uh, from doing that. And so we actually pay out a percentage of our revenue to confluencers, to our, our what we call our confluencer ecosystem. Um, and essentially, you know, we're kind of like taxing companies and paying out the people that are bringing, that are organizing, bringing people together. Um, you know, they're essentially co-creating this platform and co-creating the metaverse with us. Um, so, you know, look out for confluencers. There's an opportunity to become a confluencer right now, right? And the skills of being a confluencer and an influencer, there are some overlap, uh, but, you know, it's really all about creating space and bringing people together to be, to, to authentically connect with each other rather than carefully crafting content that fits a persona and then broadcasting that, right? So it's a little bit different, but there is some overlap. I feel uh, Jason's gig is normally the discussion of economics. Uh, I feel like you have a fair amount of thoughts here about the economics of how, how your platform will work and other stuff, but uh, we're, we're running short on time. But I, I think uh, that's, that's really interesting to hear someone speak about, not like you mentioned, like how are you people who are bringing the audience should, you know, reap a reward. I mean, I think that's, that's a very insightful way to sort of build the business. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, you know, it just aligns with what we're trying to do in the long term here. Um, and, and frankly, just with the people that are creating a lot of value in this real time internet, it's um, one of the challenges that anybody uh, that has played multiplayer games, especially before things with incredible matchmaking like Fortnite and, and Call of Duty, if you recall, uh, when you were in a multiplayer game and you had to sit in the waiting lobby for like five minutes as the matchmaking engine is trying to find other people to synchronously connect you with so you can play the game, that's true of the metaverse also, right? Bring people together synchronously is kind of challenging and will continue to be challenging. So um, for us, we recognize that and reward those that are really gifted at bringing people together synchronously within a shared context. Awesome. Daniel, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I feel like this has been, this has been really awesome and I've been, enjoyed this conversation. I, I know I've learned some stuff. I have a bunch to go think about now. So like, I was always encouraging to have a discussion with someone and leave feeling like, wow, this is really exciting. They've shared their excitement with me. And so, uh, I, you know, I really appreciate that. And to everyone listening, I thank you for, for joining us for another podcast and uh, we'll see you next time.
Music by Eric Barndoller. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide an attribution to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.